Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu, and it is my pleasure to be the host of this very exciting and informative webinar. So uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping uh, slides or presentation notes. So if you are on the webinar to earn CE credit, there's going to be a link to a poll and we need the, those to input for COPE in order to get credit. So when you see that come up in the chat box, we're gonna put it in a few times throughout this presentation. Just make sure you click on that and you take the survey and your CE certificates will be emailed you, to you later this week. Uh, you must stay on the webinar for at least 50 minutes to earn credit. And if you have any questions, of course, you can reach out to us uh, after the webinar or during the event. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Ariel Serenzi. She graduated from optometry school from the University of Houston. And then she developed a passion for specialty contact lenses and she pursued a cornea and contact lens residency at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. During the residency, she gained a lot of experience, not only diagnosing and managing really difficult contact lens fits, but also things such as orthokeratology and caring for UMSL's pediatric population. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. She's also a member of the North Carolina Optometric Society and the American Optometric Society. She now practices in North Carolina at the Charlotte, at the Vision Source Studio 2020, and she's helped grow the large myopia management specialty lens practice. So very, very excited for this exciting webinar on myopia management. And Dr. Serenzi, take it away. All right. Thank you, Stephanie, for hosting. And thank you to Paragon for making this continuing education event possible. So this is a two-part series of um, two hours total of continuing education. And tonight will be our first hour. What we'll talk about is first some of the risk factors for developing myopia. So, you know, what, what kids we may be particularly worried about and want to follow more aggressively versus those that maybe we can continue to monitor them on an annual basis. And then next we'll talk about the potential for developing some of the ocular disease that's associated with myopia. But not only that, but why, why does that happen? I think that's something really important for us to, to understand as we see these kids becoming more and more myopic. So as Stephanie mentioned, uh, I practice in Vision, at Vision Source Studio 2020 in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we love Charlotte. If you guys ever visit, definitely let me know. We'd love to be your tour guides. Um, I am currently eight months pregnant and my husband and I are looking forward to welcoming our first baby in, um, on May 25th. So, um, if you're coming to the exchange, maybe I'll bring her and you can meet her. <laughs> so some of my financial disclosures, I am an educational and clinical consultant for Paragon, Cooper, and then Valley contact lenses. So first we'll talk a little bit about why myopia management? Why might we want to bring myopia management into our practice or expand upon it, or just maybe emphasize why you're doing what you're doing? The first thing is the code of ethics that we took when we became optometrists was to make sure to keep patients' eyes and vision and general health of the eye paramount at all times. Myopia, just like some of the other diseases we manage is, is a progressive disease. And yes, I did say disease. Uh, if you look up the definition of disease in Britannica or any of the other online dictionaries, the definition goes something like this. It's a harmful deviation from the normal structure or the function of an organism. So we know that it is a deviation from the normal structure in that the eye is too long and it's not functioning properly in that the eye cannot see properly in the distance. 
Next is, yes, it's the, our priority is the patients and keeping them as healthy as possible. But it's also nice to see that it grows some of the revenue of our practices as well. And it does for a few reasons. One is that we don't have a lot of competition in product purchase um, for some of the modalities that are available. Also, you can, you can charge a little bit more as it's a specialty product. Um, and you can charge for more for your services too, because as of right now, it still is specialty care. Now at our practice, myopia management patients account for about 4% of our contact lens patients, and they generate about 10% of our contact lens related revenue. Um, I see a lot of medically necessary contact lenses, a lot of specialty contact lenses. So this is artificially pretty low. Um, if I didn't have any of those, it would be a lot higher. So I think, you know, kind of think about your practice. And if you're not doing a lot of specialty lenses, you can expect that 10% to be, to be quite a bit more. The next thing that's great about myopia management is it does generate great word of mouth referrals. Um, the, our partner that is in South Charlotte that has his myopia management practice, he can trace like seven out of 10, so 70% of his myopia management um, patient base, actually from one particular mom who is very connected within their school and her children's sports teams. And she's referred so many people to their practice. I don't have as dramatic of an example as that because it is pretty significant at his practice, but we do see a ton of patients that came to see us because a friend recommended, re recommended us. And then lastly, you know, I think it's really cool the opportunity that our profession has not only to make people see the world as good as possible, but to also be able to have an impact in their trajectory in their future vision and their future health outlook. And I can't think of many professions that have that ability to make such a significant impact that myopia management can. So for the first section, we'll talk a little bit about the definition, and the prevalence and the pathogenesis of myopia. So we all know what myopia is. Anything over a half diopter is considered myopic. And then once we get over a minus five, it's considered high myopia. That does, that does depend on what resource you're looking at. Some say minus six, but minus five or minus six is about high myopia. What I found was really interesting as I was reading through the World Health Organization and Brian Holden Vision Institute papers was they actually qualified minus 150 diopter patients as having modern vision impairment. And then those that were a minus four or more were considered blind without their glasses. And I don't know about you guys, but anytime a patient comes to me and they're like, I'm blind, um, I kind of roll my eyes a little bit because I'm like, no, you're not, you're just a myope and we just need to prescribe you glasses. No big deal. But because we, we see truly blind people. Right. But I think it's important to think about that individual and, and yeah, they are blind without, without their glasses. And that does make a significant impact on your quality of life. The more myopic that you are. So what about prevalence globally? about 28% of the population as of 2010 were myopic and 4% of those were highly myopic. It's projected that by 2050, more than 50% of the world's population will be myopic and 10% will be highly myopic. Now, Asia is kind of always, Southeast Asia in particular has always been pretty ahead of us in these trends and already 80 to 90% of their high school grads are myopic and 10 to 20% have sight threatening pathologies, things like lattice already happening in the back of their eye. So, you know, I know that this is a different country, a different area, but these trends started happening before they started happening in America. And as we'll see next, these trends are starting to happen in America too, among our kids. So I included this here, although we just went over the numbers, I just wanted to show just how quickly things are 
changing. That that um, line really does show a pretty exponential increase in the level of myopia over time and just a course of 50 years. So specifically in the United States, there um, the Holden paper estimated that over 58% would become myopic by 2050. And then specifically for kids, they didn't mention the 2050 trajectory, but as of 2013, about 50% of children were myopic ages 11 through 13, which was a huge change compared to just a little under um, 20 years ago, which, you know, 12% of the population was myopic. So that's a very significant change. And it's said in this paper that those assumptions were probably pretty conservative just based off of the fact that, um, you know, educational needs are increasing and the level of education in myopia is pretty highly correlated with one another. And I think that we can all just kind of suspect that with, you know, our virtual learning environments that we've had over the last year, that this is even more of a conservative assumption that we're probably seeing even more of a rapid rise than maybe what we thought previously. So this is the only study that I found that's actually looked at that. Um, they looked at Chinese children, 123,000 of them that were ages six to 13 years old. And they had already been monitoring their refractive error since 2015. And they actually found that in the year of 2020, there was a 0.3 diopter increase in myopic shifts compared to the previous years. So we did in fact see that backed up by some, by some science there. So what is the pathogenesis of myopia? What, what exactly goes wrong with the eye? So emetropization should work in that the refractive components of the eye, like the cornea and the lens should harmonize with the elongation of the eye. The axial length is the most important factor to make sure that emetropization is happening um, properly. So what goes wrong? There, are, there were two main theories, the accommodative lag theory and now the more popular peripheral refraction theory. So the accommodative lag theory really has fallen out of favor now that there's a lot more evidence behind the peripheral refraction theory. But I think it's important to kind of review the accommodative lag theory to see kind of where we got to, to where we are now. So the accommodative lag theory was thought that myopia was induced from under accommodation during all of that near work. It was thought that because the image was focused behind the retina at the level of the fovea specifically, that that relative hyperopia made the eye grow longer. And so it would make sense that things like bifocals and progressive lenses that treat with plus at near to help with the accommodative lag should make things better. But as papers started coming out, they found that there really wasn't much of a correlation between accommodative lag being the cause of myopia. There is a little bit of an association, but not necessarily a causative effect. Um, so this paper looked at varying le levels of accommodative lag and wanted to see, you know, if higher levels of accommodative lag maybe corresponded to more incidence of myopia. And they found that there was not a correlation. This did the same thing, but in kind of a younger population and found a very similar outcome that there was not an association um, for the onset of myopia specifically. And then this looked at from a little bit different of a perspective, if we treat with progressive addition lenses for those folks that already have accommodative lag, surely we'll see some sort of a control effect as these kids wear it. Um, they found that there was a statistically significant difference, but it was very, very small and definitely not clinically significant. So then the peripheral refraction theory started to um, become more popular as probably the, the reason why some kids become myopic. Um, the thought is, is that myopic eyes or eyes that are destined to become myopic have a shorter off-axis length 
And that creates an image that's focused behind the retina out in the periphery as opposed to the fovea. And then that is what stimulates the eye growth. So we would treat with things in, that we would treat with plus in the periphery with things like orthokeratology or with multifocals. So this is the mysite lens and we have these peripheral treatment rings that are plus zones. And so my side and other multifocal lenses induce peripheral plus through these, you know, myopic defocus rings. And then orthokeratology also induces myopic defocus. So bringing those rays in front of the retina by gently reshaping the cornea while the child sleeps. So both do the same thing in a little bit different of a way. And you can see that the two theories have a lot in common. It's just more so where what part of the retina is perhaps, you know, stimulating that eye growth, which we think is very likely the periphery. It's not really known at what level specifically of the eye that drives the abnormal elongation of the eye. Um, but it's thought that perhaps the choroid is the biggest driver um, in, in most of the data that's available. So there are some really cool studies out there. Uh, this one I really liked reading. It's um, an avian study. And in that avian eye, they showed the, the eye um, a hyperopic defocus, which is in the blue, a myopic defocus, which is in the green, and then a control. And then they looked at the various levels of the eye, the levels of the retina, the choroid and RPE and the sclera and tried to determine where the growth was happening, where the changes were happening. And they found a pretty dramatic change in the, in the chicks. So in the hyperopic defocus, so again, the blue, there was a pretty dramatic thinning of the, cor the choroid, which resulted in scleral remodeling that caused axial elongation. The control with no power or no defocus stayed the exact same. And then our myopic defocus in the green, the choroid actually uh, thickened, which in effect shortened the eye. So this is um, various levels of magnification of those changes. And you can see they're pretty extreme. This one is specifically the myopic defocus. So you can see where that dark area is in the picture A between the two triangles, that choroid just being significantly thicker. And then as we get to C and then B, it just is, you know, a little bit more magnification. So what was also really interesting is they repeated this study and actually severed the optic nerve and they still found the same effect. So that's why we think that it's more so isolated perhaps in the choroid or, you know, um, the choroid being the main driver, given that even when you cut off the neurological feedback, we're still getting this, this same um, effect that we see here. So really interesting. Now in the avian um, studies, it's a lot, it's a very dramatic effect. And we don't see that in normal, you know, human subjects, but we, we do see a little bit of it to a degree. So in this study, they induced either a plus three diopter amount of defocus to one eye and a control to the other. And then they actually switched by doing a um, hyperopic defocus with a minus three and a control. And they saw that with the myopic defocus, the plus three, there was some choroidal thickening and um, axial length decrease because of that, because of that change. Conversely with the hyperopic defocus, we saw the opposite where the choroid thinned out and the axial length got a little bit longer. Um, those changes were transient in nature, but we could see how if you continue to have that amount of defocus, how those changes could become permanent over time. This um, looked specifically at myopic and non-myopic kids ranging from 10 to 15 years old to look at just that. How does the choroid of myopes compare to non-myopes in this age range? And surprisingly, they found a 16% thinner 
choroidal thickness in those that were myopic versus those that were not myopic. And we may think, well, of course, you know, the eye is getting longer. Of course, the choroid is going to be a little bit thinner through that passive stretching and elongation of the eye. And the, um, the researchers in this study addressed that and said, yes, but only 6% of that thinning should be, uh, should be attributed to passive stretching. And in addition to that, as kids get older, their choroid should actually thicken over time as opposed to thin over time. So what, why do we care about all this? You know, what's the point here? How do we make this clinically applicable? Well, I think, you know, one thing that's really important to think about is the very same refractive air that's changing in your chair as this kid is nice and youthful with their young, healthy eyes is the same refractive air that's creating choroidal thinning, which that choroidal thinning is what can increase the risk for things like myopic macular degeneration later in life. So we're, we're watching the early phases of the disease process, process um, potentially happening at a very young age. So, so what are some of the risk factors for developing myopia? And then once we do develop myopia, um, what are some of the ocular diseases that are associated with it? So we will review the main risk factors. The first is refractive error. Um, it's actually the best predictor of future myopia, and it's even more powerful of a predictor than like genetics or near work or um, other risk factors that are correlated with the development of myopia. Um, I have this chart committed to memory because I like being able to um, just, you know, refer to it and, and think about it when I see these young hyperopic kids. Because if a child shows that they are less hyperopic or more myopic than these numbers here at the um, age next to it, then their risk of developing myopia is pretty high. And so what do we do with that information? Um, you would probably want to monitor these kids at a more frequent basis than just every year, knowing that they have these risk factors. Genetics, we do know, plays a role. Um, if a parent is myopic and the other parent is not, there's about a two times greater risk. Um, if both parents are myopic, then we have about a five times greater risk. But as we saw earlier with this um, graph here, genetics can't be the only thing at play because genetics result in very slow changes over time. And this is a very fast increase. So, you know, there are other environmental factors that are definitely at play here. Um, we also know that for a couple of reasons, one being that even across the world with all kinds of different genetics going on, we're, we're still seeing the same increase in myopia to a significant degree. And those that are of the same race, but in different locations, um, so if you have uh, Indian and Chinese origin in Singapore, they have much higher myopia prevalence than those that are in more rural settings. Um, we might think, okay, well, is it like a rural versus urban thing? Maybe, but kind of a small amount. You know, there's about a 2.6% increased risk of developing myopia if you're in an urban situation versus more of a rural setting. What probably pay, pays more of a impact on that is, is outdoor time versus indoor time. So we know that not spending a lot of time outdoors is a risk factor for the development of myopia. And we see that during seasons, there's, there are various um, variations of progression. In the summer, we see less progression. And in the winter, we see more. And it's not necessarily an activity thing because with the same sport that's performed, if it's indoor versus outdoor, um, there's less progression that's noted in those that are doing outdoor sports versus that very same sport indoors. This um, is a meta-analysis that looked at a lot of the different data regarding 
um, outdoor time and myopia onset. And they found that kids that spent less than 13 hours a week of outdoor time were more at risk for developing myopia. And for every hour that you can get past the 13, it reduced their odds of developing it by about 2%. Why is that? Well, there are several theories. Um, one is if you think about all of the things that are super close to us right now, right now we have the computer that's really close to us, your desk, maybe your chair, your phone, all of these things are inducing a lot of hyperopic defocus onto your retina. Whereas when you're outdoors, things tend to be very far away from you. There are other theories like, um, the increased levels of vitamin D when, uh, when, the level of vitamin D is looked at as has it has a kind of changes to dopamine into in the retina. Dopamine has a very similar effect that atropine actually does. So that could be one of another reason why outdoor time is protective. Um, there are other theories like higher, higher spatial frequencies, um, chromatic composition, and some of the new eyewear that's becoming available in these um, ophthalmic lenses are really looking at these as possible causes of myopia, like the spatial frequencies. So we'll see more about those theories and how they work more in the very near future. Um, we might think, well, if we're outdoor, outdoors, we're not doing any near works. That's probably why um, we don't see, we, we see outdoor time as protective. So I really like this study. It actually made the two outdoor time and near work independent from one another. And so let's look on the right side, the light gray boxes and say that the kid is doing a high amount of outdoor time. Even if, as we go to the left, if they're doing a lot of near work, um, their odds ratio is still a lot lower than if we're doing a lot of near work and no outdoor time. So we can just see that that level of protection that outdoor time provides. So what, what we could recommend to children and parents is to spend at least two hours a day out, outside if you can, or at least 14 hours cumulative amount of time per week. And that's outdoor time um, is more of an effect against the delay or preventing myopia onset as opposed to helping with progression, but it could help a little bit with progression as well. So what about near work? Some of the risk factors associated with myopia development with near work specifically are doing more than three hours at a time or just more, more than three hours total. Um, having a really close working distance. I think we see kids all the time, like these kids in the background that are just like, 10 centimeters away from their, from their work. And one interesting thing that um, is done in some Chinese schools is they've actually made it to where the kids have to sit further away from their work by the use of these bars. Um, <laughs> I like the little, on the left, there's a little girl in the background that's definitely not using it properly. <laughs> but I thought that that was really interesting to see. Um, other things, this is kind of a side note, but other things that some Chinese schools do as well is they've started incorporating lots of windows and, and skylights into their classrooms too. So uh, continuous work and cumulative work has a significant impact on our risk, but more so continuous work. So it is important to recommend frequent breaks to the kids and the parents from their near work that they're doing. In addition, digital devices and screen time, I think we could have all guessed that. And um, one paper said that there's about a 2% increased odds of myopia for every additional diopter hour of time spent on near work per week, which sounds like an awful formula to think about, but um, I kind of broke it down in an example. So if you have a child that's spending four hours a day at a working distance of about 33 centimeters, which is three diopters, and they're doing it Monday through Friday, so five days a week, and then you multiply that by that 2%, that 
that kid has about 120% additional um, risk of developing myopia than you know their their counterparts. And I think where this really starts to become concerning again is the fact that we had so many kids at home in a virtual learning environment this last year. And um, depending on where you live in uh, the US, maybe you're still having a lot of students that are still in that kind of learning environment. The potential mechanism at play, there's, there's two theories. One is that the when, when we look at something up close, we actually get a temporary increase in our axial length. Maybe it becomes more permanent the more that we do it. And then the optical theory is that when you're doing a lot of stuff up close, that hyperopic defocus on your retina is um, a little bit further out, a little bit more of a defocus. So how we can take all of that data and turn it into something that is clinically applicable is if you see a kid that has some of these risk factors, having a frank discussion with the parents. We really need to increase our outdoor time to at least two hours a day every day. Um, we really need to encourage breaks from near work as much as possible. And breaks from near work does not mean spending leisurely time on the phone. And then encouraging more frequent follow-ups. So if you see these risk factors, Instead of seeing them in a year, you could see them in six months. And when you have that discussion early, it makes it a lot easier to talk to parents about getting them into some sort of myopia management modality to buy that time that it's, it's time for them to be in it. They're already ready because you've been having these conversations. So I put an example of kind of like a script that you could say for a child that you recognize is at risk. So you could say something along the lines of, you know, your, your child at the age of six is expected to be within this normal range of vision and eye development. And unfortunately, we're seeing that he is falling a little bit low, below normal standards and is at increased risk for needing glasses for something called progressive myopia. And what progressive myopia is, is where their vision declines every year. And if it's diagnosed early in childhood, the, it'll it'll um, progress very quickly. They'll need thicker glasses every year if they even make it to a year and an increased dependence on those glasses. But the good news is, is that if we catch it early, we can slow down those vision changes. So let's see her back in six months and just keep a close eye on her. And why that's important is because the earlier that myopia onset occurs, the more rapid changes that we see and the higher level of myopia that they end up having. So this is data from 926 children ages three to 10. And you can just see how rapid the changes are at, you know, when they're, they're five years old and start off with just a minus a half diopter. By the time that they're just 11, and I'm looking at the red part here, by the time that they're just 11, um, some of these kids were already a minus five and a half. And unfortunately, we, we tend to think that perhaps stability happens at about 18, but only 75% of, of um, teenagers tend to stabilize at this point. And I think that we all see in our practice that you even have, you know, 40 year olds that are still continuing to have these myopic shifts over time. So you know, based off of that, I think it's important to not guarantee, hey, we'll be doing myopia management till they're 18 and then we can take them out of it. Um, you'd probably want to stress that it's case by case basis and, um, you know, we'll watch them very closely. And if they're stable, we can discontinue. But if they're continuing to progress, it's all the more important that we keep them in these modality options because progression is likely to happen through the mid 20s for some kids especially if they have some of the risk factors that we mentioned earlier. So let's go into some of the disease uh, of myopia and why it happens. So I think that we're all probably pretty familiar with this chart by Flitcroft. Um, at the top, we have the various levels of myopia. And then on the kind of salmon colored side is the different types of disease processes. And where those two meet is the, the odds ratio or the, the risk of developing that 
condition based off of that refractive error. So we'll go into these one by one. So a cataract. Um, the more myopic you become, the more likely you're gonna have a cataract, but everybody gets a cataract, so what does it matter? Um, well, the reason why it happens in myopic eyes a little bit faster than um, eyes that are not myopic is likely because of the oxidative damage that's happening in the eye from the vitreous degenerating a little bit quicker than what it would in an emotropic eye. So big deal, they get cataract surgery, they're actually pretty happy, but unfortunately, the higher the myopia you have, the higher risk of retinal detachment due to the fact that we have this thinner peripheral retina that's a little bit more vulnerable. So um, next is glaucoma. I found this one to be pretty interesting. Um, so the, the longer that the eye gets, um, the more tilting of the optic nerve we have and the more potential damage we have to the axons from that elongation um, and the more vulnerable they are to IOP changes. So this is a look at a myopic, opt uh, uh, myopic eye and their myopic nerve. And so you can see that myopic crescent that we have temporally. So what happens to those nerves that come in from nasally is there's a really sharp bend. And then temporally, those, those ganglion cells that are coming in are getting really stretched and they're under a lot of tension. So if we have some of these maybe normal IOP variations, it could more easily damage these nerves based off of their, their positioning um, approaching the optic nerve. And the bigger the parapapillary atrophy zone, which is indicated by the black areas, the, the more at risk these patients are for developing myopia, I mean, glaucoma. And even those that don't have glaucoma, so don't have progressive vision loss or progressive nerve loss, um, it is, we do see that myopia can lead to visual field loss just because of um, how stretched out those nerves and the, the, the nerves are going into the optic nerve head. Um, now that vision loss is, should be stable, it's not going to be kind of like glaucomatous change unless they're um, still elongating very rapidly. So that's, that's an important differentiation when you see an eye, and it also makes it really tricky to manage patients that are highly myopic on whether or not you're helping with um, glaucoma or not, or if they even have glaucoma. So retina detachments, um, you know, that kind of makes sense why we would be more at risk for retinal detachments. The longer the eye is, the more myopic it is um, from, from the stretching of the retina tissue. The problem is, is that myopes compared to non-myopes tend to have a poor prognosis for retinal detachment repair. Um, and then unfortunately we see that that poor prognosis is related to their best corrected vision after retinal detachment surgery. And only 34% um, of high myopes, um, or I, sh I should say 34% of myopes have worse than 2200 vision after retinal detachment surgery, whereas um, high myopes, there's 20% uh, of them get that. And then you have less success with the reattachment of the macula. Um, sorry, I said that wrong. So high myopia, only 20% of them have less than 2200 acuity. So this is a big one, myopic macular degeneration. So again, the possible mechanism is the fact that the eye is just getting really long and stretching out that tissue. But what specifically is mostly at play is the fact that the choroid is really thinned. Um, and the more choroid thinning we have, typically the more advanced of myopic macular degeneration we have. And unfortunately, specifically myopic macular degeneration is expected to increase significantly. So right now we may not see much of it, but by 2050, it's going to become much more common. 
And it doesn't necessarily have to be high myopes. In fact, 43% of the cases were um, less than a minus five diopter. So um, I think that that's, that's something that really shocked me when I read that. This is a great paper by Dr. Mark Bullimore that I, I recommend um, looking over. It's, it's a really awesome paper. Um, and he looked at when, you, when we do myopia management, what kind of an impact are we having on the risk for myopic maculopathy later in life? And just one diopter of myopia management, so slowing it by one diopter, reduces the risk of myopic maculopathy by 40%, which is huge and so easy to do um, with some of the treatments, which we'll talk about in part two. Um, you know, you can slow a diopter in just two to three years. And if we compare that to something like AREDS, it's really only a 25% reduction for advancing into more of our advanced AMD with six years of supplementation. Um, Dr. Mark Bullimore had a, I was on a podcast with Dr. Chris Wolf, who's also a vision source doctor. His, um, podcast is called iCode. And, um, he basically interviewed Dr. Bullimore about this paper and some other papers that were in the works. And, uh, he, I'm trying to remember if I'm saying this right, but it, they talked about the number needed to treat it for myopia management. And Dr. Bullimore said that in order to benefit one patient um, from developing myopic macular degeneration, you only need to treat, need to treat five. So number needed to treat is um, five. And if you compare that to something like a statin, um, so in order to prevent one person that takes a statin from having a cardiovascular event, you have to treat 200 of them. So the number needed to treat is 200. So I think that that's, you know, very, uh, a really powerful statement um, from some of the research that he's done. So yes, these patients are, you know, at risk for these disease. We don't know for sure that they're going to develop them, but we know for sure that we have the ability to reduce their risk as much as possible. What is happening is the fact that every year that they're coming to see us and we're not intervening, their world is becoming more and more blurry and it, it does result in functional vision loss. Um, what was once the ability for them to walk around a room and be in an unfamiliar room and be able to make their way around um, could drastically change in five, six years. And that's something that parents have a hard time understanding. I, you know, with dentistry and some of the other medical interventions, you can look at a kid and typically see, you know, the crooked teeth or whatever and see the need for braces or um, what have you. But parents have no idea how their kids see. So I, I talk about this all the time because it has been the number one thing that's helped me demonstrate the importance of myopia management to parents is just simply showing the parents what their child's world looks like with plus lenses that are, you know, equivalent to their, their myopic eye. And not only that, but their changes over time. So if they went from a minus one to a minus two in one year, show their parent, this is, this is how they saw the world last year. This is how they're seeing the world this year. If this pattern continues, which it will, uh, this is how they'll see the world three years from now. And then you'll have parents say, oh my God, I have no, I had no idea. And I find anyways with my patients that talking to them about their child's vision and the impact that it has on their quality of life is way more impactful than me talking to them about these potentially blinding eye diseases that they'll develop later in life. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if you guys have a similar experience, but um, that's that's been ours. So in addition to functional vision decrease over time, uh, quality of life scores are actually very similar between high myopes and patients that have keratoconus. In addition, 
the more myopic that kids become, the more likely it is for them to maybe have some of the occupations that they want later in life to maybe not be an option. Um, I had a patient the other day who was a minus nine and I forget what branch she was trying to go into. I think it was the air force and she wasn't able to because her, her uncorrected vision and just vision in general was, was not good. Um, so I thought that was really sad. Um, and then lastly, their, you know, refractive surgical options later in life, if they're even a candidate, the higher myopia they have and the more cornea they have to remove to, to correct the myopia, the more risk there are for complications. And not only that, but, you know, how well they see after the refractive surgery as well. So, you know, there, there are so many reasons why myopia management is important. And um, again, I just think that our profession just has this really cool opportunity to make a significant impact on um, the, the quality of life of these, of these kids. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and getting your hour of CE. Um, part two will be on May 5th. Um, Stephanie will go in a little bit more detail about that and send out links. Um, and that is where we'll specifically go into the various treatment options, who would be a candidate for them, and kind of what to expect when we prescribe those. Um, please email me if you have any questions, um, comments, and I would be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Awesome. That was amazing. What a great presentation. I just, I love all the different interesting studies that you presented. I mean, obviously a lot of this has to do with peer-reviewed research and so much interesting data that's gone on. And um, I did have a couple questions for you. So I love your little tip on making the glasses for the parents and showing them this is how little Johnny sees the world. And this is why we need to do something about it. Um, do you, do you, what is, what do most pa patients, parents say when they put those glasses on? Are they really shocked? Is it something that they, that they already kind of know, you know, if they have myopia or is this something more for parents that don't really understand it? Yeah. So, um, I do it for myopic and non-myopic parents alike. Um, I do see a huge shock factor where they almost kind of recoil a little bit from the lenses and are like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. And it's especially powerful for patients that are parents that are not myopic, but you know, some, some parents that are myopic, may not remember what it was like to have those changes. So although they know what blurry vision is like for you to demonstrate how that is progressively changing over time, um, it, it makes a really big impact for parents. And what I love is are the follow-up questions after, which is, you know, well, what can we do? Um, so now you're like a team member with them as opposed to, you know, being like, this is what we need to do. Um, and it, it just makes the process a lot, a lot better. And you're like a support system for this family. Oh, I love that. I think that's great advice because like you said, with your analogy on when you see a kid that has crooked teeth, it's, you can look at them and know that there's a problem and you need to fix it. But if it parent has no idea, they're just kind of taking your word for it. Like, oh, okay, I guess we need to do something now uh, because the doctor says so, but, but having them be more of like a team approach, I think is, is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. That's such a, such a great idea. Thank um, you. I think I stole it from somebody. Oh, <laughs> definitely did. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I'm getting this your analogy on the crooked teeth. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is uh that's really good. That's really interesting to think of. And, and I think even in the presentation, how you're talking about, well, not only do we need to slow down the, their myopia because of diseases that could happen and they increase tremendously over time, but think about if they ever wanted to get 
refractive surgery in the future. Like, like you mm -hmm. said, they may not be a candidate if they end up getting to be too, too high. And I think that that is, that's, these are just little things that parents sometimes don't think about. So mm -hmm. it really is our job to educate them and say, listen, th these are just some of the things that little Johnny may not be able to do, or, or uh, we just want him to have functional vision. And, you know, if you're a minus 12 getting around the house in the middle of the night is nearly impossible uh, with yeah. your contact. So it, it does make, make your life, you know, a little bit more, more challenging when you get to, to that group. Um, so one last question, what would you say as far as if somebody really wanted to get involved in myopia management, what are some of the best ways to get started? I really love review of myopia management as a resource. They have just amazing um, peer reviewed, you know, re reviews of papers that they break it down where it's really easy to understand and then make it clinically applicable. But not only that, but they also have really great practice management tips and tools as well. Um, so that's, that's been a great resource that I've looked at. There's also the Brian Holden vision Institute that has, um, courses, but then just attending CE, you know, and learning all that you can. Um, so you become truly Gazunai, the specialist, um, vision source, the exchange for vision source will have, um, more CE and for myopia management. And with that CE, we will dive more into kind of like the finances behind myopia management, incorporating it into the business, which is super helpful. Um, and that will be available live at the CE, but also online as well. That's awesome. Well, thanks for all of your, your pearls and tidbits. And this is such an amazing lecture that you've put together. We've put in the chat box for anybody that's interested if you'd like to attend Dr. Sorenzi's next event, that is going to be in a couple weeks on May 5th, and that is going to be on myopia management intervention options. Something that if you enjoyed this event, you'll definitely enjoy the next one as well. That one is also COPE approved, so you will also earn some CE credit. So that is in the chat box for anybody that wants to register. Make sure that you do also click on the link for the survey for tonight if you want to earn CE credit. So thank you, Dr. Sorenzi, for such a wonderful presentation. And I look forward to seeing you again in a couple weeks. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you everyone for joining tonight.